Once again, as we gather right after a message, our brother John, thank you so much for that exposition. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and once again, you have a way of putting things that will crystallize an insight such as the fact that from the first to the seventh church, you start with all believers and end up with, with unbelievers. And uh, that's, a, that's a crucial progression of there that also kind of indicates a crucial progression into unbelief and into apostasy and heresy on the part of the church. We're here to talk about the Reformation, not so much in terms of the, the past, in terms of history, but the need for Reformation in today's church. But I do want to go back to Calvin. In his letter to Emperor Charles V on the necessity of reforming the church, Calvin says something very interesting. He says, everyone is agreed that the church requires reform. The question before the emperor is, is the need for this reform urgent? And I think that's a good question. I, I, Calvin was able to say, everybody agrees that the church requires reform. How urgent is it? So Mark, how urgent is it? Well, if, if we listen to what John said in his wonderful overview sermon, really, of Revelation 2 and 3, two huge chapters all in one expositional message. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, if, if, if we listen to that, we, you, you all brought it down to his word to that church in Ephesus on you've left your first love. Yeah. And in that sense, I, I left feeling challenged, uh, and I Me think too. that that's an urgent need for us. And that can sound vague, you know, love Christ more, but your quotation, the, the Flavel quotation, the other one were, were helpful. I think we as pastors have to realize that at the very core of the church is exactly that. It's that love for Christ. We want to pray for that to grow in our own lives and in the lives of our members. Amen. Okay, Ligon, where is it most urgent? Right now, I, I continue to see two large concerns. These are big headings. There are a lot of specific things that could come under them. But, it, you know, as you mentioned, Calvin saying, is it urgent? The other question that he asked and the Reformers asked is, what was the nature of the reform that was needed? Because the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation agreed that moral reform was needed, but they did not agree to the kind of doctrinal reform that the Reformers were calling for. So it wasn't just an urgency for reform, it was an urgency for doctrinal reform. And you see that in the things that Calvin, I mean, Calvin and any of the Reformers could have joined with two centuries of pre-Reformation Roman Catholics who were protesting the moral condition of the church. But they went beyond that. Luther went beyond that. Calvin went beyond that. And I, I still think we have to look at doctrinal reform that is necessary today in the churches. And we need to look at reform in connecting our practice to our doctrine. The great, the great weakness of evangelicalism is that we have believed that our methodology has nothing to do with our theology. That you can, you can uh, the, the way you do church is kind of up to you. But the reformers, and, and frankly, I would say, clearly in the New Testament, the apostles understood the unity of doctrine and the order of the church. Absolutely. And, and so, the, the, way, the way we do the ministry of the church needs to be consistent with and flow out of the message that we are preaching, the gospel, and be grounded in the theology that we are discipling people in. So, so let me I think make both of those areas are important. Let me make an assertion, and uh, on this I'll, I'll, I'll cite Luther and his example and his, his exhortation, and that was, you have to begin the reform at the worship of the church. As, as Luther said, it all comes down to what happens when the church gathers and what is said in the pulpit. John, in terms of how Reformation would happen now, would it happen any differently than during the Reformation? No, I think, I think Luther was absolutely right, and I think that's the whole point <clears throat> if you've left your first love. Um, you can tell whether a church has that first love by how they worship. What is the focus of that? Look, you all are moved to the core when you sing of Christ, right? I mean, it's just, we're swept away. Why? 
because we have that first love. And it's a rich love because we get it. It's, it's informed. I mean, look at Ephesus. They had the sound doctrine. They could test somebody and they could determine whether they were telling the truth or whether they were false. They were faithful to the truth. That's a given there. Uh, that, that, ha- that, is, that is, of course, absolutely necessary. But how you guard against the loss of first love is you make sure that all your church gathering for worship is Christ-focused, and that you don't have people sitting in the dark being entertained. That's, that, that, that just drives in the wrong direction. Um, and, and again, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but with hymns, as I said at the beginning, I, I, can't, I can't come up with those words, but somebody else can come up with them for me and literally take me out of myself, right, and elevate me when I sing those things because they're expressions that I can't form, and uh, they, they allow me to praise Christ in a way that left to myself I couldn't, I couldn't do. But I, but I think a church, a church that has begun to leave its first love will demonstrate that, first of all, in the loss of a passionate heart for worship. We've got to get tangible here. Go ahead. I've got two practical things real quickly on okay. this. One, I think to do what you're talking about and what you're talking about, League, the reform of the church, pastor, you need to realize the music is your business. If you think the music is not your business, you have misunderstood your call to teach your congregation. You need to realize the music is your business. You know, the, the scripture readings are your business. The prayers, your, the public worship of the surf of, of this church is the responsibility of the elders. And it's particularly in most churches, the way it would be structured, it, it, it is or should be seen to be the responsibility of the main teaching pastor. So you're the worship leader. In that sense, yeah. Yeah. If we're well, going to use that word, worship leader. The, but the, the, point the, that, the other thing, real one. quick, is go buy J.I. Packer's book, Quest for Godliness. J.I. Packer, Quest for Godliness. It's 30 years worth of essays on the Puritans, and he knows them well. And they are theological and practical, kind of like what we've been trying to model in comments and messages. Jim has looked carefully at the Puritan movement. He knows it well. He did a PhD on it. He's taught on it for decades. And they're practical. He looks at evangelism. He looks at the services. He looks at prayer. He looks at their reading of the Bible. So friends, that you could use a different chapter each month and just let that begin to reform your own thinking about your local church, a quest for godliness, J.I. Packer, there are copies in the bookstore. Luther's point was that if the worship is right, other things right may follow, but if the worship is wrong, nothing right will follow. So if that be the case, let's be tangible and practical here, then what needs to be reformed today, Ligon? If we're just taking the same kind of view the reformers were taking and What's wrong that needs to be made right? Well, go go back to Mark's point again. In the public gathered worship of the people of God, Keith Getty said it on the uh, introduction to the hymnal in the video, that if if the content of what you're singing Mm -hmm. is not reflective of the theology that you're preaching, Right. Your people are probably going to pre- believe the content of the singing, not the theology of your preaching. That's right. So there's got to be a coordination between what we're doing in sung praise and in prayer and the substance of the worship service with the theology that we're trying to inculcate in our discipleship. That's one thing. That's, a, that's one of the biggest things I think there is today. But I think Luther's principle can be extended to how you do evangelism and discipleship. Sure. Let me make a, an assertion here. I think there are a lot of pastors, or uh, even I should say, that there are a lot of churches, maybe in many cases to take Mark's admonition, there are pastors who aren't as involved as a pastor must be in take, making this his business. But in many churches, they're looking for songs that include no heresy. That's not enough. We need songs that have genuine content. Some of the songs I've heard have no capacity for heresy. There's not enough theology in them. 
It reminds me of a, of a, a story that comes from quantum physics, exactly what you expected here. <laughs> where a, a story is famously told of, of, uh, of Max Planck, the professor, I believe it was, who had a, a student defending a doctoral dissertation. At the end of it, the student said, is it right? And Planck famously responded, it's not even wrong. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not even possible for that to be right or wrong. It's nothing. And, and so I, when I think of the songs we sang, and by the way, we sang some really old songs here, but you know, in the, in, even in this new hymnal, we sang some glorious new songs. Amen. I mean, they, some of the people who wrote those songs are still alive and still writing, yeah. but they had incredible content. Yeah. Some of them are here. Yes. Yeah. yes. And writing, well, Amen. we're here. Thank you. So, John, what else needs to be fixed? <laughs> the rest of your application now? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just think, um, just going back to last night with John Piper, I think worship is motivated when I understand from where I have been redeemed. Um, instead of always preaching this positive, 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 make people feel good, I think our people need to understand the depth of depravity, the utter hopelessness of the sinner in his condition, unwilling, unable, and to understand that we have literally been sovereignly lifted up out of death and darkness and blindness. You know, the Apostle Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 5 is giving some reasons why he's motivated in ministry. And one of those reasons that just strikes me, and I, I, I don't want to quote it and, and miss, so th this, is, this is amazing. He says, if we're beside ourselves, it is for God. You know, if you think I'm crazy because I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, energized, it's for God. What does this come from? The love of Christ controls us. Why? Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, that is a statement of limited atonement. That's particular redemption. He's saying one died for all, therefore all died. He's saying it isn't just that I have a sense of the general love of God for sinners. When He died, I died. The all is the all who died when Christ died. He is motivated by particular redemption. He died for me. And I, I think how you generate that love for Christ, I mean, you can take the, the, the point of depravity and what you've been saved from. You can take the point of, of particular redemption and realize that he, you were in Him when He died. You can go to John 17 and realize that the... the the, the reason the Lord wants to bring us to heaven is, is shocking. Uh, he, he says in that high priestly prayer, this is a stunning statement. He says, uh, I and them that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. What? He loves me the way he loves his own re beloved son? I just think all that theology about Christ, the fullness of the riches of the glories of Christ, motivates the love. And people have to be taught all those things. They have to be taught all of that. So the greatest aid to worship is the explanation of Scripture. So the, the, the expositor of the Word of God in that exposition is, is going to exalt Christ. And that's what motivates the love for Christ. It's not something you whip up in a song service. The song service is the response to the love. It's the, it's the accolades that rise out of a loving heart. And, the, and that heart is generated by a knowledge of the truth. By the way, Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, doesn't get you to that level of worship because all glory doesn't go to him.
when we look back at uh, certain moments in church history, even back in the book of Acts, Simon Magus, uh, we come to understand that what we now call prosperity theology is not as new as many people think it is. But when I look at prosperity theology and I see what's presented as Christianity, th that's when I have my Tetzel moment. That's when I look at that and say, that has to be an abomination to God. And whatever that is, it's a different religion than that handed by Christ to the apostles. And, and so let me extend my Tetzel moment a little bit further. And with all due respect and appreciation to every Christian bookstore owner who actually sells Christian books. When I go into what is often called a Christian bookstore, and once I stop sneezing from the incense and I get past the Jesus junk, trip over several candles on the way, past the bathroom plaques, and eventually get to a book. And when that book is simply chosen by what sells in terms of prosperity theology, that's when I want to cleanse the temple. One of the things is we, we choose, I don't think many people may be aware of this, the, the, the four of us, uh, uh, Mark, Lig, CJ, and I approved every single book that's in that bookstore. And there are actually books in this bookstore that we want you to read and uh, that, that, that you will do well to read. But, you know, in terms of Reformation, like, and how good can we expect it to get? You're a church historian. I mean, we're not pointing back to any particular moment and saying, crystal clear, that's what we're aiming for. How good can we expect it well, to get? Well, I mean, we're not looking back at some golden age in the history of the church either, because when you, back, when you look back at those golden ages, there were, there were all, all sorts of problems along all, uh, alongside of even remarkable works that the Lord was doing. So we're not trying to get back to the 50s in the Eisenhower era. We're not trying to get back to the, to the 1650s or to the 1550s. We're, we're trying to be faithful to what the Bible says yeah. about how the church is supposed to be and what our witness is to be in the world. And we, we can expect that to be mixed. It's going to be mixed somehow. But we can see areas of challenge and areas of progress in every generation. For instance, the Reformed tradition has not had in the last 400 years a great track record on racism. We, we've been horrible in that area. And you, the young guys here, the young guys here, you get this. It's, it's my generation and 10 generations before us that didn't get this. You get this. You don't want a church that's uh, monochromatic. You want a church that looks like the book of Revelation where every, people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation are around the throne worshiping the Lord. I praise God for that. That's something you get that... I've been blind to and generations before me are blind to. That's why, by the way, we need one another. <laughs> and, um, and so when I, when I see there's things that this generation is getting that deeply encourage me that, that we're going in the right direction. I, I also think that there is going to be greater pressure on the, the, especially the young guys here. If you're 35 and under, there's going to be greater cultural and even Christian pressure on you to cave on biblical morality in areas of gender and complementarity that my generation ever experienced from our culture. And you're going you're to have to bow your back up and stand on the Bible and say, Jesus gives the marching orders in my church, not the culture. And so I, I think... Amen. I, I love some directions that, that I see the younger generation going, and I'm just, I'm watching, man, you are going to face headwinds in these particular areas, and I just want to be there to encourage you as best as I can while you're facing those things.